Aloha. I'd like to welcome you here and thank you for so much for joining us. So my name is Dr. Catherine Takeda Wong. I'm a naturopathic physician and an acupuncturist. So for those of you who aren't familiar with naturopathic physicians, like medical doctors, we have to attend a four-year medical school. We are trained as primary care physicians. And as such, I can order lab tests, write prescriptions, and do a school physical, just like other doctors. However, a big difference is that naturopathic doctors are trained in the power of nutrition to build health from the inside. So I use personalized food recommendations, as well as vitamins, herbs, and other types of natural medicines to address the underlying causes of disease and treat the whole person. I also have a master's degree in oriental medicine, which allows me to include Chinese medicine and acupuncture in my treatment protocols. So before we begin, I wanted to let you know that if you have health concerns that you'd like to talk with me about, we offer a no charge phone consultation called the Personal Health Strategy Session. This is a 15 minute strategy session where we can talk about your condition and come up with a plan to see how I can help you the most. Arranging a consultation is very easy. Just call our office at 808 425-2987 and let our staff know that you're interested in a no charge phone consultation. So today we're going to be talking about some of the risk factors for autism and some of the things that can be done to treat autism. So this is a, a really big topic um, and I do want to say that this this presentation is probably only going to be about a half hour or so. So um, normally I would do a full lecture on this usually that goes over an hour, hour and a half. So we're definitely not going to be talking about everything comprehensively. But the main focus of today's presentation is just to let people know that there are things that we know now from research that are associated with a higher risk for autism. And there are also things that we know that um, can help to decrease the risk of autism. So basically that if we know some of the risk factors, and again, this is based on research, based on evidence, um, and if we try to avoid those things, this is before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy in early childhood, then we, there are things that we know that can help to reduce the risk of autism. So I'm going to be talking about those things because there's just not very much awareness about this and there's a lot that can be done. And there is also a condition that I'll be talking about that is a potentially reversible form of autism. So I'll be talking about that because this is a really exciting breakthrough in the treatment of autism. And it's something that also plays into some other things that I'll touch on in terms of helping to reduce the risk of autism as well. So uh, just to go over some of the main things, there are a number of things that we'll talk about. But I'm going to be touching on some of the main things. Um, so some of those include things like in the mother, vitamin D deficiency, thyroid problems, iron deficiency, taking certain depression medications, um, high levels of toxins, um, including lead and mercury, and also the Foley antibodies, which is something I'll be talking about again at the end. So I've been treating autism successfully for many years, and I got into it because my brother's on the spectrum, and I was really looking for ways to be able to help him. And so over the years, I spent a lot of time researching and trying to understand what was going on in autism, what was causing it, and how it could be treated and helped. And I can say with confidence um, over treating many children uh, with autism over the years that due to underlying and potentially preventable risk factors, there are definitely physical imbalances that can be treated medically. I've done my training through the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, or MAPS, which is an organiza organization which trains medical doctors as well as osteopathic and naturopathic doctors and chiropractors in a lot of this newer research that has been finding that there are definitely risk factors for autism there so that there are ways that we know that we can be able to reduce the risk for autism as well as things that we can do to treat autism once it comes up and real progress comes from treating underlying causes rather than just treating the symptoms so 
risk factors can be minimized with special diet, supplements, herbs, um, and medicines, both natural as well as pharmaceutical medications. I try as much as possible to avoid pharmaceutical medications, um, but those are just some of the main treatment options. And what I mean by treating the underlying causes rather than just treating the symptoms, for example, there are many children on the autism spectrum who will have self-injurious behavior where when they get either excited or frustrated, they might be biting their hands or they might be hitting their heads with their hands or with their fists. Um, they might be banging their head on the wall or on the floor or on furniture. Um, or they may even be throwing things at themselves. Um, and so many children, when they go and say to see their regular pediatrician, most often the pediatrician or even the developmental pediatrician will often just, just prescribe an antipsychotic medication like Risperidol. Um, and this can help. I'm not opposed to using the medications, especially if the child's condition is very severe and if they're posing a significant risk of harm to themselves or sometimes to others if they also get aggressive. Uh, however, research has found that many times when children are aggressive or have self-injurious behaviors where they're harming themselves, that it could actually be due to pain that's going on. So many of these children actually have acid reflux or they may have colitis, like inflammation in their intestines, and they're having pain. And so they're having the self-injurious behavior as a way to be able to distract themselves from the pain, um, and also just as a way to kind of help alleviate some of the pain that they feel in other areas of their bodies. And many of these children don't have the ability to say, my throat hurts or my tummy hurts. And that leads to a lot of frustration because they have this pain, but they don't know what's going on. They don't know why. And there's, there's nothing that they can do oftentimes to communicate that they're having this pain. And so people don't know how to help them. And so it's often treated as a symptom by just using an antipsychotic medication. Uh, but when we treat the underlying cause, what I do is see these children and we take a very thorough medical history. I do a physical exam and we'll do tests, whether it's lab tests or other kinds of tests to try to figure out, okay, what are the underlying causes? And then treating that, treating the acid reflux by, for example, some children taking out certain foods from their diet or using natural or pharmaceutical medications that can help to treat acid reflux or decrease the inflammation in their gut. We very often find that once we treat the underlying cause, that their self-injurious behavior or their aggressive behavior will get better. And so that's why I mean by treating the underlying cause is that you know we can treat a symptom, but if you really want to have long-term resolution of that symptom, treating the underlying cause is really gonna be the answer. So again, please feel free to use the comment section uh, to ask questions as the talk progresses. So, um, some of the things, like I mentioned, so um, as I, one of the things that I do when parents come in, so I, ha I do work with parents who say they have a child with autism and then they want to have another child, but they're really scared that they're going to have, that there's, their uh, second child will have autism as well. Um, or they maybe they have a family history of autism. Um, maybe they have a family member who has autism. And so, um, or they're just family, they're just um, parents who are very aware and want to know about some of the risks and want to do everything that they can to optimize their health of their baby and optimize their health during pregnancy to try to help prevent any potential issues. So I'm going to go through a few of the things that have been clearly associated in research with, and with a higher risk of developing autism. None of these things are a guarantee, but they have been associated in research with a higher risk of developing autism. So some of those things are vitamin D deficiency. So there was a study that found that uh, when women were deficient in vitamin D during their pregnancy, that that was a risk factor. There was a higher incidence of infantile autism in their children, or basically the children developing autism as infants. Um, one of the thoughts is that vitamin D is really important to helping to regulate or balance the immune system. 
And so if you don't have enough vitamin D, it's going to be really difficult to have a properly balanced immune system, and that can potentially affect the fetus. Uh, because we do know that one of the things that's also associated that has been found in mothers, of, not all, but in a significant number of mothers who have children with autism, is that some of them are actually making antibodies or proteins where their immune system is actually attacking the brain of the child. Um, and why that happens, we don't know. Um, but we do know that that is happening in certainly a number of cases of autism. So one of the theories is that um, the vitamin D deficiency, because vitamin D is important for balancing the immune system. If you don't have enough vitamin D, then that is a risk factor for having imbalances in your immune system. And so it's thought to be um, one, of, one of those factors. Um, and another study found that um, there was also um, a, an effective increase in latitudinal location of mothers um, related to the amount of UV radiation that they received in the wintertime. So basically, mothers who um, were at higher uh, who are further away, further away from the equator and where you naturally don't get as much sun because the natural way we get vitamin D is sun. And um, so they found that mothers who um, lived at higher, that lived further away from the equator and were not supplementing with vitamin D had an increased risk of autism as well. And it was thought that that was correlating with a deficiency in vitamin D. So another thing that was, that's been associated with an increased risk for autism are thyroid problems. So I always tell mothers before they get pregnant that they should be screened for thyroid problems. And if you haven't done that, then you can be screened for thyroid problems during pregnancy as well. Um, however, it's, it, it, there, there are more limited options in terms of treating thyroid, um, certain thyroid conditions during pregnancy. So it's always better if you're thinking about getting pregnant to get screened for thyroid problems before you get pregnant. Um, and so one of the things that they found that there was an increased incidence of autism among mothers who had both hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And what was interesting was that with hypothyroidism, where the thyroid gland is, is lower functioning, that there was an increased risk of autism um, in those children. Another study actually found that um, when there was, uh, when there were, was hyperthyroidism or basically high to where the thyroid is um, too high function, thyroid is making too much thyroid hormone, um, that, that some of those mothers also had an increased risk for ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in the child. So that's another thing. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is that the thyroid gland is extremely sensitive to environmental toxins. So toxic things like lead or mercury or arsenic. Um, and there are many other toxins that we're commonly exposed to. But uh, for basically, one of the things is that heavy metals, if, if you have higher levels of heavy metals like lead or mercury or arsenic, then that can cause thyroid problems and it can cause a number of other problems as well. Um, but in studies, they also found that a higher levels of lead and mercury in uh, mothers when they were pregnant, uh, that they had a higher incidence of uh, basically of autism. So particularly, uh, one of the studies, one of the studies was looking specifically at silver fillings or amalgam fillings. So those are the fillings that are commonly used in tooth fillings, and they look silver. And their dentists will call them silver fillings, but they actually contain uh, mercury. Some of some of them contain up to 50% mercury. And they found that women who had six or more dental amalgams had a three time increase, 300% increase um, in the likelihood of having a child that was diagnosed with severe autism in comparison to women who had fewer amalgams or dental fillings. So one of the things I tell women is if they, they want to get pregnant, uh, one of the things is that if you have amalgam fillings or silver fillings, to have those removed 
before you get pregnant, before you even start trying to get pregnant. Um, and that's important because many women don't even realize that they're pregnant until they're at least usually about six weeks pregnant. And those first few weeks are really critically important for the development of the brain of the baby. And so you don't want to be taking out silver fillings, um, you know, early in pregnancy or during pregnancy, because the process of removing those amalgam fillings can potentially release more mercury into your system than would happen if you just left them in your mouth. Um, and so I tell women, if you do have silver fillings, get them removed before you get pregnant. Um, if you are pregnant and you do have silver fillings, don't get them removed. Um, but I do recommend that you, once you, after you have the baby, um, that you try to have the silver fillings removed by a dentist who is trained in proper and safe mercury removal. And it, it is important to have a dentist who's properly trained. Uh, locally here uh, on Oahu, I recommend, there's a few dentists that I recommend. Uh, Tony Kim is one and Chad Kawashima is another dentist um, that are properly trained. If you're um, located in other areas, uh, you can look up the Holistic Dentist Association. There's other dentists, uh, dental associations, uh, but it is important to have someone who's properly trained in the proper removal for those fillings. Um, some other toxin exposures um, besides mercury are lead. So again, higher levels of lead in um, in the, in the woman when she's pregnant was associated with higher risk of autism. So one of the things I tell families is uh, in terms of trying to reduce the risk of exposure to heavy metals um, like lead and mercury. Um, so get a really good quality water filter. Um, so I usually recommend either at least a countertop or under the sink model um, that has really good um, stats in terms of their ability to remove heavy metals. So that's really important. Uh, other, you know, certainly don't get silver fillings put in. And a, a big source of mercury uh, for many women is fish. Uh, and so it's really important when you're pregnant, most pregnant women have heard about this, uh, but it's really important to avoid eating very large fish. Basically the larger the fish, the higher the mercury content. So some of the biggest fish are things like shark, marlin, um, swordfish, tilefish. Um, those are really big fish. So definitely none of that at all in pregnancy. But even some of the, the fish that are kind of moderate levels of mercury, so that includes ahi, tuna, aku, um, even mahi-mahi has moderate levels of, of um, mercury. So I recommend that women try to avoid um, those fish as much as possible in pregnancy. And I often will recommend um, you know, things like wild Alaskan salmon, which is lower in mercury levels. Um, but I, I recommend caution definitely um, because even some of the, the recommendations for fish um, in, by the American Academy of uh, or the um, American Association of Pediatrics um, or other associations. Um, some of them, I, I tend to be more conservative um, in my recommendations for, for fish. So that's definitely something that you wanna look at. Um, another toxin that has been associated with a higher risk of autism is something called bisphenol A or BPA. And so they found that in a study uh, with mothers who had uh, higher levels, so three times, um, so, so basically they did a study uh, of mothers who had children with autism, and they found that the mothers of the children who had children with autism had urinary levels of bisphenol A that were three times greater than in the, than in the control group. So basically the mothers who had children with autism had three times higher levels of bisphenol A in their urine than mothers of children who didn't have autism. So bisphenol A has also been associated not only with autism, but other conditions like high blood pressure, reproductive problems like infertility or low sperm count or reproductive cancers um, like 
prostate cancer or um, other kind of gynecological cancers like uterine cancer. It's also been associated with asthma, obesity, and breast cancer as well. And where do we find BPA? The most prevalent source of it is in plastics. Um, so the plastic water bottles, especially the really soft plastic water bottles that you can squeeze and they can collapse easily. Um, also, it's present in plastic wrap. Um, and then in almost all plastic uh, Tupperware containers or those kind of things, it's also present in the can lining of canned goods, um, in soda cans, coffee pots, plastic and paper cups, dental sealants, and also in cash register receipts, which creates the filmy feeling on a lot of receipts. So what I recommend in terms of re reducing the risk of autism is really trying to reduce the amount of plastic you're using as much as possible using stainless steel or glass water bottles. Um, try definitely never, never heating any plastic or putting hot foods in plastic. Um, so don't put plastic wrap in microwave it, those kind of things. But even like coffee pots, um, getting a glass coffee pot instead of a plastic coffee pot, avoiding canned foods or sodas or paper or plastic cups, those kind of things. And then if you handle cash register receipts, trying to wash your hands as quickly as possible after you, after you handle them. So um, other things that have been associated with an increased risk uh, for autism is iron deficiency. So it is really important that women make sure they're getting enough iron during their pregnancy. And so also making sure that you have a prenatal that has a good amount of iron. Usually for most women, about 18 milligrams a day is usually good. But I, I like to test iron levels during pregnancy because I wanna make sure that it can vary according to how much iron you're getting in your diet. So I also wanna make sure that the amount of iron they're getting in a prenatal is, in, is at the adequate level. Also taking certain depression medications during pregnancy like SSRIs, uh, which include Prozac uh, or um, Lexapro or other kinds of medications that are used for depression and anxiety. Those have been associated with a higher incidence of autism as well. So you know, again, it's a it's a cost benefit factor, um, but we'll usually I'll usually recommend ways that we can try to see. Okay, can we either lower a dose or switch you to a different medication, uh, or try to help treat issues with anxiety or depression naturally? And there are a number of ways that depression and anxiety can be treated naturally. I see a number of cases with depression and anxiety, and there definitely are natural ways to address those. So um, looking at things like that. Um, also, there's an, a number of other factors that we're not going to have time to go over today. But one of the things that I want to talk about um, is something called folate antibodies. And so I'm going to just grab a piece of paper over here to be able to illustrate it. But folate receptor antibodies are what are thought to be a potentially reversible cause of autism, which is really, really exciting. So in fully antibodies, what's happening is that you're having problems with the immune system. And so I'm just gonna show this piece of paper over here, and I'm just gonna draw over here. So if you can see over here, so you can see that I have a, a rectangle over here. And this rectangle is representative of a brain cell. And so a brain cell, basically, there's a, a vitamin called folate that's really important that needs to get into the brain cell. And folate needs to go through this gate over here. So it basically has to go through this gate. Just kind of angle it here. So folate has to go through this part has to go through this gate in order to get into the brain cell. Now what's happening is that in autism, there are these proteins, and I'm just gonna make these little T-shaped things over here that are representing antibodies. But what's happening in autism is that in many cases, not 100% of cases with autism, but many cases of children with autism, they are making, actually making, their immune system is making antibodies, which are actually 
blocking this gate over here. So even if the mother is taking folic acid during her pregnancy, if baby has these antibodies, then they're blocking the gate. And then folate can't get into, the folic acid can't get into the brain cell. And from there, you don't have normal brain development because folic acid is really important for the brain development of the baby. But what we found is that 75% of children with autism actually have this condition called folate receptor antibodies. And so, again, it's, it's causing two problems. One is that it's blocking folic acid from getting into the brain cell. So we don't have normal brain development. Number two, the second problem is that these antibodies are actually attacking this one part of the brain cell. And this can actually cause inflammation in the brain. It's not life-threatening inflammation like meningitis or encephalitis, but it is inflammation that can cause problems with brain function. So it's a low-level chronic inflammation that causes problems and brain inflammation has been documented in autism. Again, not life-threatening brain inflammation, but a low, low level chronic inflammation that is interfering with brain function. And this can be one potential source of inflammation because basically the, these antibodies are things that normally our immune system makes antibodies to attack things like viruses or bacteria or other kinds of things that will, you know, will use that to attack and kill bacteria and viruses. But in this condition, this is what's called an autoimmune condition where your immune system is actually attacking your own body. And in this case, it's present in about 75% of children with autism. So there was a study of 93 individuals with autism and they found that 75% of them had these antibodies and where they're attacking this part of the brain and then causing brain inflammation and also blocking folate from getting into the brain cell. Now there are two ways that this condition can be treated. So if we know that the person has this condition, and this is tested by a blood test in children with autism, and basically what can happen is that we give a specific type of folic acid, that's called folinic acid, I just read it here. So it's called folinic acid. And folinic acid is a specific form of folic acid that can get into the brain cell. So we give folinic acid, and even if someone has these antibodies that are blocking folate from getting into the brain, we can give folinic acid and it can bypass it and go directly into the brain cell. And then from there, we start to see improvement in brain function because finally now the brain is actually getting this B vitamin folate that it needs for brain function. Another thing that we found interestingly is that milk and dairy products, so this is basically cow's milk products, goat milk, um, sheep milk products, and then also camel milk, actually can't, what they do is that if a person has this condition, if they have the folate receptor antibodies, it triggers the immune, consuming dairy products can actually trigger the immune system to make more of these. And then from there, you have more of these that are blocking folate from getting into the brain. And you have more of these that are also attacking the brain and causing more brain inflammation. And so that's why many children with autism, we see that when we take dairy out of their diet, many of them will improve in their cognitive function, awareness, language, social skills, behavior. Um, because if they have this condition, they will often improve if we take dairy out of their diet. So, and the research studies are, it's, it's very, very exciting. So there was a, um, an early study of 25 individuals that had uh, folate receptor antibodies, and they had two children out of the 25 that were very young. They were below the ages of four. And they found that when they treated this condition, so giving the folinic acid and taking dairy out of their diet, that these children actually had full recovery from autism and their neurological deficits. And that, so that means their neurological deficits, meaning difficulty with language, behavior, 
awareness, cognitive function, social skills, all of the hallmark symptoms of autism. So basically it you know it's something that can be treated and especially if we dis, if we diagnose this condition and treat it early before the age of four it is thought to be a potentially reversible cause of autism which is a huge breakthrough uh, because most doctors you know most pediatricians most developmental pediatricians aren't even aware of this research and so they would just say what a reversible cause of autism that's not possible but it is, it is present in the research studies, if you look at that. And I will post links to research studies in terms of all the things I talked about. So you can go and look at all the research studies if you're interested in that. Um, but that's something that's really, really exciting. They also found that in children who have the folate receptor antibodies, and even if they are older, so they had children who are older, who were ages five, seven, and 12, and they found that when they treated the folate antibodies, again, giving folinic acid and taking dairy out of the diet, that they didn't fully recover from autism, but they did show improvement in their neurological deficits, meaning that they showed improvement in their language, behavior, social skills, uh, all of those things, all the hallmark symptoms of autism, because again, we're treating the underlying cause. Now, if you are looking in terms of the prevention side of things, how could you prevent it? Right now, there's no way to test if you're pregnant to see if, you're, if your child has that. But what I do is I recommend specific types of prenatal vitamins that have that specific form of folinic acid because most prenatal vitamins have folic acid. And most people aren't aware that folic acid is actually a synthetic man-made form of the vitamin and if you are if you're taking folic acid then and the child has this condition then the folic acid can't get through it'll be blocked by those antibodies but if you take the folinic acid form in the prenatal then it can bypass that and then you're even if your child has this condition they can still get the folate that they need so I usually will talk with families and moms and dads um, who are either considering getting pregnant or um, if they are pregnant right now um, or also in early childhood, there are things that we can do to screen and reduce the risk of autism. And if your child has autism, there are many things that can be done to treat it. The folate receptor antibodies just being one of those things. There's again, many, many more things. But if you have more questions, um, if you want to talk with me, please call our office and schedule a free 15 minute phone consult, again, called the Personal Health Strategy Session, because there are a lot of things that we can do to help to reduce the risk of autism, optimize health before, during, and after pregnancy and early childhood, and then also many things that we can do to treat autism. So again, I just really wanna thank you for joining me and, um, just look forward to hearing from you and talking with you about any questions that you have. So again, you can call our office at 808-425-2987 and you'll also find the contact information on our Facebook page. Mahalo and I look forward to being with you in three weeks. Um, in two weeks, it will be May 27th, which is Memorial Day. So we'll be off for that day and then we will have our next Facebook Live coming up on June 3rd. Okay, aloha, thank you.